Hey, welcome to Family Church. We are a diverse, spirit-filled, life-giving church, healing hurts, building relationships, and developing leaders. My name is Pastor John Mark. I'm so excited that you've connected to our page today. Be sure to grab a notebook, a pen, a paper, your phone, however you want to take notes and get ready for today's message. Today, we're beginning a brand new series called I am worship. We got t-shirts made. They're available for purchase in the lobby. I am worship. We're talking about worship, what worship is. And over the next few weeks, we're going to dive into this. Next week, we're going to do uh, a discussion between me and my wife, Pastor Chris and his wife, up on the stage talking about worship and what that looks like. It's, it's really, really going to be a great series. But here at Family Church, we define worship as this. Are you ready? The celebration of who God is. The celebration of who God is. If you've talked to people, like really, the word worship is predominantly a church word. And if you said, hey, what's your favorite kind of worship? People are going to say like, well, elevation, Bethel. That's all I know. Uh, I don't know a lot. Of, I don't, huh? Who? Who? Yeah, besides family church, besides Pastor Chris, the best worship pastor in the entire world. What's another one? Hosanna, Vineyard, Hillsong. Worship what? Worship mom. Is that you? Are you worship mom? All right. So, so many people would say what kind of worship music they enjoy but music and singing songs of worship to God is a very small part of what worship is. Thus the t-shirt, I am worship, right? Because worship is the celebration of who God is. In John 4.23, it says this, yet a time is coming. And then he's like, oh, wait a second. And it now has come. When the true worshipers, so there are, and listen, can I just be me today? There are true worshipers, and then there are posers. Huh? Posers. You ever know the word poser? You know what the word poser is? Am I not allowed to say that in church? Are we awake today? Am I allowed to say poser in church? Okay. A poser is someone who pretends to be something they're not. Right? It's that person that you know during a song, like they're singing a song of worship, and they're like, whoa, Jesus. <laughs> but you know they ain't never sang that song before in their life. They don't worship at home. And listen, I tell the worship team this all the time. You don't get to get up on the stage and lead worship if you don't worship. If I watch you stand in the seats and you don't worship, but then you audition for the team, you ain't getting on the team. You ain't getting on the team. What we do on the stage is an overflow of what we do in our personal lives. Right? That's true worship. Where true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. So there's two sides of this. There's a way to worship God in the spirit, and then there's a way to worship God in the flesh, in the, in the truth. And, for they, and for, for they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. So today, I want to give you a fresh start in initiating a life of worship to God. A life of worship to God. And don't worry, if you're not a singer, if you're not a musician, you can worship. All right? You can worship. Please do not, please do not say, well, Pastor Mike, you came out here and you sang and I can't sing like that, so I can't do worship. Dude, you're missing the point. We're not talking about music. We're talking about you waking up in the morning and intentionally deciding to have a good day is worship to God. It's worship to God. We're going to get into this. We're going to break it down, all right? So there are two kinds of followers. There are two kinds of people that worship. There's two types of Christ followers. And we're going to look at this in Luke 7.36. Now, one of the Pharisees invited Jesus to have dinner with him. So he went to the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. Jesus liked to slouch. When a woman who had lived a sinful life, what kind of life? Sinful. Some of you can identify. <laughs> a sinful life in that town. Right? She's not just 
lived a bad life, but she had a reputation in that town that he was in, okay? You got what I'm saying? All right. Uh, she went to the Pharisees. She brought an alabaster jar of perfume, and as she stood behind him at his feet weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears. Then she wiped them with her hair, kissed them, and poured perfume on his feet. Now, you got to understand, his feet were dirty. They had open-toed sandals. And they didn't have paved streets. And they rode animals. And there was animal feces on the streets. And she put her hair all up in that. Uh, do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. Washing feet was dirty business. Washing people's feet was reserved for the low-level slave of, of the owner, of the master. It wasn't like you were first level. It was low level. It was like entry level. You get what I'm saying? She wept, wiped his feet, poured perfume on him. When the Pharisee who invited him saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would know who is touching him. Can we be for real in church today? He was like, yeah. Why are you letting this dirty woman touch your dirty feet? Because he saw her even lower than his lowest servant. She's, she's a nasty woman. She had a nasty reputation. And if you were a prophet, you would know not to let this woman touch you. You might catch something. She's a sinner, man, and the worst kind, right? Jesus answered him, Simon, I have something to tell you, brother. Tell me, teacher, he said. Two men owed money to a certain money lender. One owed him 500 denarii and the other 50. Neither of them had the money to pay it back. So he canceled the debt of both. Now, which one of them will love him more? The one who owed the larger debt. You have judged correctly, Jesus said. Then he turned away. Then he turned toward the woman and said to Simon, do you see this woman? I came into your house. You did not give me water for my feet. You didn't wash my feet. So you think you're some high class sinner looking down at some low-class sinner, but I'm telling you that low-class sinner knows how to love more. Come on, because those who love much have been forgiven much. If you don't understand that each and every one of us in our worst, each and every one of us absent from Christ are the low-class sinner, every single one of us has no ability no ability within us to overcome desires of the flesh and those, sinful, and those sinful wants. None of us. And I don't care how good you think you are. I'm serious. Like I, This is what the problem with the Pharisees are, man. And it's one of my major gripes with the church today. Is judgmental Christians. You are not the high class. Every single one of us is the low class sinner. None of us has a right to judge anyone's behavior just because we've been set free from our bad behavior for 10 seconds. We don't even need to read the rest of the story because you know what's up. So let's go on. The custom of the day for a host was to greet with a kiss, wash the feet of the guests. Now again, he never would do that himself, but one of his servants would do it. And then anoint the head of the guest with perfumed oil. In Luke 7, it shows us a picture of two types of people that come into church. Two types of people that come into church. And I am in no way being judgmental. I am in no way saying what I see looking from this side out. But I will say that there are people who can't enter in to the presence of God because they have somewhat of a pharisaical spirit. And worship and singing never touches their heart. Can we just get past this and sit down and hear a sermon that I'm not going to take notes and I'm not going to remember by Tuesday? Pastor Mike, are you being harsh and facetious? No, I'm being for real. 
let's just be for real, let's just call it things what they are, let's just call it what it is, there are two types of people that worship. There are people that worship out of necessity, they worship out of responsibility, they worship out of this is what our family does on Sundays, my wife dragged me to church today, my husband dragged me to church today, well the kids have an event so they dragged me to church, and so we came, but I'm thinking about everything else but God. I'm thinking about lunch, because that's important. We gotta know where we're going after church. We do, seriously. I gotta worry about, did I get my fantasy football lineup set up? Yo, that's for real. What's the first game? What's the first game at 115 or 120? I gotta make sure I got my lineups ready. All these things are going through our mind. Instead of saying, Lord, I'm gonna be present moment. I'm gonna be here in your presence. And I'm gonna give you an hour of my undivided attention. And I'm gonna be here. So Simon, Simon the Pharisee, he was a religious leader. He has no emotion. He has no water. He has no kiss. He does no anointing of the oil. There's no sacrifice. He, G, he treats Jesus with disrespect. He esteems Jesus as an ordinary man because he says, if you were a prophet, you would know that this was a hoe. I'm, I'm just trying to wake you guys up. I'm just trying to wake you up. All right? I'm just trying. It, it might be a little warm in here. That's why you're a little sleepy, right? That's why we keep it cold. I normally keep it cold, keep you awake. If you were a prophet, he says, you're not a prophet. You're not a prophet. You're just a normal guy. He forgives little. He forgives little. I can't forgive this woman. She's got a reputation, which means he loves little. Then you have this sinful woman, and really, we don't even know her name. Many people try to say her name is Mary. Many people try to say it is that same woman that Jesus wrote in the dirt that says, if you have not had done this sin, cast the first stone. We don't know. We could make, we could, we could make things tie together. She's a prostitute. She, she's a prostitute. She does naughty things for money. But she wept at his feet. She washed his feet. She kissed his feet. She poured perfume on his feet. She sacrificed much. She sacrificed a year's worth of wages for this one act of washing his feet. She treated Jesus with respect. She esteemed him as extraordinary. She treated him as God, as a worship to God. She's been forgiven much, which causes her to love much. The sinful woman's desire to see and worship Jesus was greater than her fear of being ripped out of this guy's house and stoned in the streets. Because really, he didn't have to let her in his house. She was taking a risk sneaking in to get close to Jesus. The conclusion is clear. Simon, as the high-class sinner, had the same problem as the low-class sinner. It's just a matter of degrees. He was educated, she was not. The woman owed a greater debt, but they both owed a debt that they could not pay. I'm just telling you, all of us have a debt to God that we cannot pay. I don't care how well behaved you are. I don't care how well behaved you are. I don't care how disciplined you are, that you get up and you do your devotions every day, and, you, and you've been able to overcome major obstacles in your life. I get that, that's great, that's great self-discipline but you still can't repay Jesus Christ laying down his life for you. You still can't earn salvation. You can't earn it. It's a debt too big. So today I wanna talk about true worship. I wanna share three insights about what true worship is. Are you ready? True worship. Number one, true worship is a revelation of God's love. It's a revelation of his love. A revelation of God's love. A revelation of God's love. You've got to believe that God loves you. You've got to believe that God loves you. Now, for me, that wasn't really a big revelation. 
because I'm a logical thinker. If God is love, if God is love, and he chose not to love me because I was an idiot, then he would cease to be God. So for me, it was no big deal that God had to love me because God is love. He has no choice in it. He has to love me. Got that? My bigger problem is that does God like me? Because my dad has said to me before, my dad says, boy, you're, you're lucky I'm your dad. I have to love you. Because right now, boy, I don't like you at all. Huh? Come on, somebody. You know you got to love them to get to heaven, but you don't like them. Like your love language, like your way to walk in love is avoiding them. Huh? Hey, hey, baba. You know what I'm saying? It wasn't until this last trip I was on, I was on a fishing trip with a bunch of pastors. I was out in the, the Montana mountains, uh, floating down this river, uh, fly fishing. And the, I felt the Lord say to me, I delight in your presence. I delight in your presence. Now the word delight, it goes beyond the fact that he has to love me. It means that God is choosing to spend time with me because he likes me. Dude, you gotta get a revelation that God not only loves you, but he likes you. How can God like me with all my, no, 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 that's your problem. You don't like you. You don't like you. But until you believe that God likes you, you can't get to a place that you like you. Worship starts with a revelation of God's love. The revelation that draws you to him. He likes you. He wants to spend time with you. And because of that, it should draw you to him. John 3, 16, say it with me. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. He loves you so much that he gave his one and only son. 1 John 4, 9, say it with me. God showed how much he loved us by sending his one and only son into the world so that we might have eternal life through him. He loves you this much. Ephesians 3, 16, say it with me. I pray that from his glorious, unlimited resources, he will empower you with inner strength through his spirit. Then Christ will make his home in your hearts as you trust in him. Your roots will grow down into God's love and keep you strong. And you may have the power to understand as God's people should. Watch how wide, how long, how high, and how deep his love is. May you experience the love of Christ through it. It's too great to understand fully. Then you will be made complete with all the fullness of life and power that comes from God. He loves you, he loves you, he loves you, he loves you. He doesn't love you when, he loves you now. He doesn't love you when you get it all together. He doesn't love it when you've avoided all bad behavior. He loves you now. And that should draw you to him. True worshipers, a true worshiper is someone who has a response of our hearts. A response of our heart. A response. So, when I have to walk out and do communion today, I didn't walk out there singing a song just so everybody could hear my voice. Come on now. It's childish. But that song was banging. And that song was hitting. And it was right there. And we couldn't end it yet. And we needed to go one more time. And that was my response to the love of God and the goodness of God and the presence of God. There's a response that says, I got to, all I want is for you, you to be glorified. Not anybody sing, sing off key, sing flat, sing sharp. There's a response that happens based upon who God is. If our hearts never respond to who God is, we've got to check our salvation. 
we've got to check if we are in a relationship with him. Let me talk to married couples for a second. Married couples. I don't talk to the dudes. Dudes for a second. You come home from work. Your wife got home before you. Let's just assume we both work. Your wife gets home from work before you. She got a babysitter. Kids aren't even home. You walk in. There's music playing in the background. You smell that special perfume that she puts on when. And there's a trail of, now this has never happened to me in my entire life. I'm just making all this up. <laughs> there's rose petals leading all the way up to the bedroom. My man, you're going to respond to that. You are going to respond to that. You are going to be like a deer during the rut. Tails going up. Noses going up. You're going on a hunt. No, I'm the only one talking to me today. Man, I'm trying to help a brother out. Maybe the fantasy was way too high. Maybe I, maybe I set the bar too high. Okay. There's an expectation that happens. There's a response that happens when the stage is set and there's something good brewing up. All right, I'll talk to the ladies. The husband beat you home. And you walk in the front door, and immediately you smell your favorite meal that he cooks. And you don't have to cook tonight. You don't have to think about nothing. He's got it all. Say he's got light music playing in the background. He got a babysitter. Not the same? Hey! Man, I'm telling you right there, boy. Still may not work out in your favor, but... <laughs> but there's a response that happens. Oh, my favorite meal. You thought about me. There's a response that will happen, right? There's a response that happens. And then that's what worship should be, right? The celebration of who God is, a response of our hearts to his goodness. Luke 15 shares the stories of three different accounts of something being lost and found. There's the story of the lost coin. There's the story of the lost sheep. And then there's the story of the lost prodigal son. After the son had foolishly spent all of his inheritance, he was working in a pig farm, eating pig food. He had a revelation. He's like, I'm sitting here eating pig slop. And my father's lowest servants get to sit at his table and have a full meal. I'll go home and be at least a servant in my father's house. He had the choice to stay in his current misery or return back to his father. What he did was an example of responding with the heart. I realize I'm in a place that I should not be. I'm feeding pigs. I'm feeding something that can never feed me. I'm talking to somebody right now who has an addiction that you're feeding something that can't feed you. I'm talking to someone right now who you have depression or anxiety and, and, and in your mind you keep feeding these thoughts that can never feed you life. We gotta get back to the Father's table. We gotta get back to the Father's table. All right, so the response, I need to get back in the Father's presence. And when you understand how much you've been forgiven, it makes you bold. Ephesians 3.12, read this with me. Because of Christ and our faith in him, we can now come boldly and confidently into God's presence. That's what we pray when we take communion. Because of the blood of Jesus, I have access to God and I can come to him boldly. Hebrews 4, 16, so let us come boldly to the throne of grace. Let us come boldly to the throne of grace. Listen, true worship is motivated by a heart of gratitude. True worship is motivated by a heart of gratitude. Number three, true worship 
is a revolution of our lives. A revolution of our lives. The Spirit of God stirs something in your spirit. I don't care what spectrum of Christianity you're on. When a worship moment hits, and now, so just so you all know, we go back tomorrow, uh, 9 a.m., we sit down and we assess the entire service of how things went. We go back through, through the set, who was leading, who was singing, how did it hit, and we will, we will diagnose all aspects of what we did today, delivering the gospel at an excellent level. I, th I think you can uh, agree that we deliver the gospel at an excellent level. But I'll go back and I'll talk with Pastor Chris and I'll say, you know what, that song, it didn't hit the way I thought it should hit. I think that we need to work on that person who was leading that song. They need to take a little bit more time and press in to the spirit side of the song. I say that to tell you this. If, if we sing a song of worship that we know the presence of God is in that song and it hits and it doesn't matter what spectrum of Christianity you're on, you're gonna feel it in the room. You're gonna feel it in the room. A few months ago, there was this, there was this young guy, he, he had only been here like a couple times, and, and the, the song was just hit, and, and, and it was there. And I looked down, this guy's like this. He's like in awe, just watching this whole thing. Really not a believer, really, really new to the whole church scene. So I had to go talk to him after church. I said, hey, what was that? He's like, I don't know what was going on, but I was feeling something right here while that song was happening, and I just couldn't ha help but smile. It's a revolution. It's a revolution of his life. It's a revolution that he felt something happen in his spirit, maybe for the first time in his life. That's what church should be. Church should be that thing when we come together as a corporate body of believers that ignites something in our spirit. My heart bleeds for people who go to dead churches hearing about some dead God in dead scriptures that they don't ever breathe life into the living word of God and make it applicable for people's lives. It, it just drives me crazy that that's happening. We, there should be a revolution of our lives when we step into worship. Listen, God tries to interject his life into our lives, but will you let him? Because we're not robots, because we have free will, God will never override your will to touch your life. Can I, can, can I, can I be honest with you? It's not God who's standing in the way of you being blessed, it's you. You stand in your own way of God blessing you. I'm talking to somebody right now. You stand in your own way from being delivered and set free from depression and anxiety. Your excuses as to why it's okay that you keep having anxiety, but you don't know. You don't understand how hard it is for me. Who doesn't? Who don't? You don't know me. You don't know what it takes for me to get on this stage every week. But the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead lives and bides on the inside of every believer. The same spirit that brought dead things back to life again is the same power that can deliver you and set you free from depression and anxiety. Don't get it jaded, honey. Don't get it jaded. It takes a whole lot of prayer for me to get out on the stage every week. Come on. We won't, when, when revolution starts, when, when, when a revolution of celebrating who God is happens, it, it becomes almost impossible to worship God with a half heart any longer. Okay. The sinful woman desired to see Jesus, so she broke in to someone's house. She broke, yo, she broke in. Yo, we're like, we're like commending her for breaking the law. Yeah. She got in there. 
But she said, I'm going I'm to see Jesus. I'm going to see Jesus. Yo, there was these dudes who had a friend who was paralyzed, but they wanted to get to Jesus. They got on the roof of this guy's house, and they ripped his roof off. Yo, you're about to piss me off. You ripped my roof off my house. Yo, who's paying for that? Who's paying for One, you're going to put my solar panels back on? <laughs> They, they broke this dude's house to get to the presence of Jesus. But we don't want to drive more than 15 minutes. Oh, hey. We want the convenience of the gospel and not the creator of the gospel. To be in his presence to be in his presence, in his presence there's fullness of joy. Where two or three are gathered together in his name, there he is in the midst of them. One can send a thousand to flight, but two can send 10,000 to flight. It's what community and coming together as believers does. I've got to be in the presence. The revolution of worship will stir emotion in your soul. And it's okay to experience that emotion, express that emotion in different ways. There are many times we see people crying during worship because it's just a cleansing. There's something happening that's going on. There are people who shout. On the third week of this series, we're gonna talk about postures of worship, that there are different ways of body expression that we can worship God. You see, some people need a cleansing and when you let go physically of something that you held emotionally. It looks different. So the sinful woman had displayed her worship by kneeling, kissing his feet, wiping his feet with her tears. She was weeping. How could you love me? How could, you, how could God be in my presence because I'm a sinner? My greatest encounter with God my greatest encounter with God, I was 18 years old. And it was at a teen camp. And teen camp's always like this spiritual awakening moment. And every year at teen camp, somehow God used me or my mom would call me up and I would lay hands on teenagers and we would have like these great moves of the spirit, whatever. But this year, nothing happened. Like it was the first night, the worship band happened, blah, 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 but nothing happened. There was no move, nobody got prayed over, there was nothing. And, and you know, I had this prideful thought that it was because of me, because I, I was in like some major sin. I had become full-blown addicted to, to drugs. I wasn't living for God. In fact, I was kind of like doing everything but living for God. And I had believed, I thought, I, I mean, I truly believed that I had committed the unpardonable sin, that I had lost my salvation, and that God no longer loved me. So I snuck out of my dorm that night, and I climbed up into the, the hill up behind the dorms, and I light, lit up one of my Marlboro lights, and I was smoking a cigarette up in the woods. Now, at that time, that was like a big sin. Like, that was like, you, you're doing something really bad. One, you're 18, you can't even smoke cigarettes. But also, you're, you know, you're harming the temple of the Holy Ghost, so you're in sin. And I'm sitting there, and I'll tell you, as true as I'm standing here, I felt somebody sit down next to me. I felt someone sit down next to me. And I wasn't afraid, but it startled me. If, I, if, if that makes sense, because I felt this presence. And I knew enough to believe that it was God. I'm kind of like, what is going on right now? This is a cigarette, right? <laughs> What's going on right now? What's going on right now? I said, God, how can you be here with me right now in the middle of me sinning? Right? Because I had believed this was a sin. How could you be with me in the middle of this sin? And as, I'll never forget this moment. Whether I heard it with my ears, or I heard it in my stomach, or I heard it in my head, or if I made it up, I'll be for real. It changed my life, so it doesn't really matter. 
I felt as if God said to me, what don't you get about I will never leave you nor forsake you? What don't you get about I will never leave you nor forsake you? It didn't matter what I was in the middle of. He was with me. He was with me. Oh, it's easy to shout that he was in the fire with the three uh, Hebrew boys because they were doing something great. I will tell you, he was with the sinful woman during every act of sin. What don't you get? I will never leave you nor forsake you. When you get that, it creates a revolution in your life that I must remain in the presence of God. King David in 1 Chronicles 21, 24, and this is the passion in which I worship. King David said, I will not present a burnt offering that has cost me nothing. I will not present a song of worship that costs me nothing. And you know what it costs us on a Sunday morning? Energy. It costs us energy. It costs us some pride. Because it takes a lot to go from this to this. That takes a lot, a lot. But David said, I can't come to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, the great almighty God. I can't come into his presence without something that didn't cost me something. It's gonna cost me to worship. It's gonna cost me to worship. God has called us to worship him in our flesh, our heart, our soul, our mind, our will, our emotions, and in giving. Simon wanted a casual appearance of a relationship. I'll have him over for dinner, but I ain't touching him. I'll have him over for dinner, but I ain't honoring him. I'll have him over for dinner, but I ain't washing his feet. I want people to see that I had the teacher here, but he ain't no prophet to me. The sinful woman abandoned all. She spent all she had for one moment in his presence. Father, we thank you today that we could come here to worship you, not just in spirit, but also in truth. I pray today, God, that we would be inspired to take that next step in worship with you, that maybe we would step out of our comfort zone and worship you and express that worship in a different way. I pray throughout this week that our life would be worshiped, that we are worship. We are the embodiment of worship because we celebrate who you are in our everyday lives. You are Jehovah God. You are the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. You're the first of our day. You're the end of our day. When we rise in the morning, your praises will be on our lips. As we lay down to sleep at night, your praises will continue to be on our mouth. I praise you, God, that we are fearfully and wonderfully made because we've been made in your image and your likeness. You love us so much that you made us to be like you. We celebrate your greatness. We celebrate your presence. We celebrate your power. If you're here today and you've never had an opportunity to make Jesus Christ the Lord of your life, we'd like to offer that to you. If you're watching online and you've never had an opportunity to make Jesus Christ the Lord of your life, maybe you found us on Facebook accidentally today. Today's the day of salvation. And I want to pray this prayer with you, and all of us will join together. Dear God, I come to you just like I am. I believe that Jesus Christ is my Lord and my Savior. Jesus, I invite you into my life to change me and to make me new. Thank you for accepting me. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Man. I just got, I got to do something, man. This, you don't even know what a miracle this young man is over here to be able to pray that prayer that loud. I got to give you a hug, Lucio. I got to hug you, brother. Can I have a hug? Thank you. Love you. Huh? <laughs> take a picture. Take a picture from Mama. I love you, brother. That's a miracle that he could pray that that loud. Woo! That touches my heart. 
If you prayed that prayer for the very first time and you're watching online, would you type amen in one of our chat rooms? One of our online hosts would love to connect with you. If you're in the room today and you prayed that for the first time, would you allow me the honor to celebrate you for two seconds? Would you just wave at me and say that you prayed that for the first time? Is there anybody here at all? Yeah, I see you. Anybody else real quick? Awesome, awesome, awesome. One of our ushers and our care team members has a little book. It's called Starting Point. It's a six-day devotional. We'd love to give that to you today. If you're here today and you need prayer for any reason or you need to connect with somebody, we will have care team members at the front and we have a care team table in the lobby. Um, whatever you came here today for, you need a hug, I'm here, I'm down on the floor already, I'll give hugs all day. Uh, get what you came here looking for. We also have the t-shirts available in the lobby. Father, we thank you today that your word will not return void, but it will accomplish exactly what you set it forth to do. We thank you, Holy Spirit, for lives change and transform. We worship you for who you are in Jesus' name. Love ya. Thank you for watching today's message. My name is Ashley, and if this message has made an impact in your life in any way, I'd like to ask you to do a couple of things. First, we want you to like and subscribe to our channel and join us right here every Sunday at 9.30 a.m. or 11.30 a.m. The next thing I'm gonna ask you to do is take a next step on your journey, and we would love to help you do that. You can head on over to FamilyChurchNY.com or email us at team at FamilyChurchNY.com to get started today.